Today, I'm very happy to announce the talk by Dan Harris, a philosopher of language and communication, who already was in the series as a commentator. Dan is associate professor of philosophy at Hunters College and the CUNY Graduate Center, where he works since 2014. And he is also involved in the new philosophy in the New York Philosophy of Language Workshop. Uh, Dan received his PhD uh, in 2014, and he is concerned with natural language philosophy, of course, and the philosophy of mind, and also the history of analytic philosophy. Uh, specifically, he has worked, among other topics, uh, on inferences, on context dependence, uh, on intentions versus commitments in speech acts, um, and he also has a very interesting co-authored article on social and political applications of speech act theory that uh, today he will talk about why communicative intentions, uh, this is a question, uh, and this is a topic that is particularly interesting in the light of theories that see speech acts more in a social network of commitments, like in the work by Bart Hertz, for example. And Dan's talk will then be commented by Josh Armstrong from the Department of Philosophy at UCLA. Um, Josh is assistant professor there with a PhD in philosophy from Rutgers University. And his interest includes philosophy of biology, in particular animal communication and the evolution of human language and communication. Uh, for example, in an upcoming article on the, on the evolutionary foundations of common ground. So I open the floor for Dan Harris, please start. Thanks so much, uh, Manfred, and thanks for inviting me and thanks for to Josh for uh, agreeing to comment. I'm just gonna share my screen here. What I'm gonna talk about today is, you know, why you should be a kind of Gricean about speech acts in 2023, okay? And I think the answer to that is pretty different than the reasons that Grice gave for us to be a Gricean uh, back in the 50s and 60s and 70s. Um, so I just want to in introduce the, the sort of Gricean model of communication and speech acts to start off with. Um, so this is, this is probably a, a review for most, for most of the people here, but the basic idea here is that um, when I'm trying to communicate with somebody, when humans are communicating with each other, at least a lot of the time, the way that they do it is by revealing their intentions to each other. So this starts with a communicator who wants to produce some kind of response in an addressee and the response could be to get them to believe something or reinforce a belief that they already have or it could be to get them to act in some way or to form an intention to act it could be any number of other kind of cognitive responses um and there are lots of ways in which you could get for example a belief into somebody's head but at least a lot of the time according to grice and others in the gricean tradition um a communicator might might um, form as have have as a strategy for accomplishing this um, that they try to reveal to their addressee the intention to have this response in them. Okay, um, and in order to reveal to do that revealing, uh, they produce some kind of utterance. Okay, if all goes well, the addressee perceives the utterance. This might then require some kind of semantic decoding. But usually the semantic decoding doesn't completely get the addressee all the way to the point of recognizing what was intended. And so some further pragmatic inference has to happen. And uh, again, if all if all goes well, um, the the addressee recognizes what the the, the speaker in, or the the communicator intended to 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 do to them to to get them into. And then of course there's some further kind of communicative success that would result if uh, if the if the addressee then goes into the state of mind that was intended, okay. So it's one thing to understand what somebody meant, and it's another thing to be convinced. Uh, for example, okay. Now there's a long tradition, kind of starting implicitly in in the work of Grice himself, but then being made more articulate in the work of Strassen and Schiffer and Bach and Harnish and I, I some of my earlier work of thinking that this is not just a theory of communication but it's also a theory of at least some kinds of speech acts, what we might call communicative acts. And the basic idea here is that we can distinguish different kinds of speech acts by uh, plugging in different values for R in the 
in the framework that I just gave, right? So to so for example, I've argued in some previous work that we should distinguish assertoric speech acts from directive speech acts um, by thinking that the former are intended to produce beliefs in their addressees or some kind of belief-like states of mind, whereas the latter are intended to produce intentions or plans in the addressee. And uh, and that's, a, I think, a really basic and important distinction in the sort of taxonomy of speech acts. But of course, there are lots of other possibilities of things that we might want to plug in as the value for R. I won't talk too much about this taxonomic project right now, but that's but that's the that's the basic project of turning this theory of communication into a theory of speech acts. Okay. Now it's important to recognize also that this is not intended to be a, a theory of like every possible speech act that anybody's ever talked about. So there's this distinction again, sort of implicit, somewhat implicit in Grice, but made more explicit by Strassen and Schiffer and especially Bach and Harnish this distinction between conventional and communicative acts. So intentionalism or Gricean intentionalism is supposed to be a theory of communicative acts, but there are also these conventional acts, things like the act of getting married by saying I do, or the kinds of things that judges and people testifying in court do, where these aren't really attempts to just communicate via intention recognition, rather they're sort of invocation of social, invocations of social conventions or rituals. And so some people have argued that it's a kind of defect of the kind of of the Gricean story that it can't account for both kinds of communicative, uh, uh, both kinds of speech acts, both kinds of elocutionary acts. Um, I think it's actually a feature. I mean, these are, I think, really different kinds of things that we do when we speak, right? So, um, so one way to see this is to recognize that, for example, conventional acts require much richer kinds of social facts to be in place in order for us to do them, right? Like getting married requires, you know, a whole set of social conventions that you're participating in, in a way that asserting something or asking a question does not. And you have to be in the, in, it has to be, the act of getting married has to be performed relative to the jurisdiction of some specific set of social conventions in order for it to work. Whereas asserting something, you can do it across international boundaries. And it, there's just no question of like which jurisdiction you did it relative to. Um, there's tons more cross-cultural variability when it comes to things like marriage and the kinds of speech acts we perform in court, not just in terms of the linguistic means or vehicles by which we perform them, but also just in the nature of the acts themselves and their goals and their outcomes. And so one way to sum this up is to say that these the conventional acts are like social kinds, whereas communicative acts are natural kinds. Uh, on, the, on the kind of Gricean view, to perform a communicative act is to exercise um, cognitive competences and social competences that all humans, all at least all adult neurotypical humans share. Um, whereas when we perform these conventional acts, we're engaged in some kind of very localized social practice. So I can talk more about this later, but it's important to recognize that this is not supposed to be a theory of all illocutionary acts. Um, okay. So how did... Here's, let's talk for just a moment about how Grice tried to defend this theory. On his view, the, the way that you get to this theory was not by giving a kind of an empirical theory of some, you know, natural phenomenon exactly, although maybe he wasn't opposed to that too. But at least in his original work, he he tried to do it by means of conceptual analysis. So the, the theory originally gets articulated via um, explications of this kind, right? So an utterer you meant to do something by uttering X is true. If and only if for some audience A, you uttered X intending A to produce a particular response R, A to recognize that you intends the first intention um, and for them to, for, for the addressee to fulfill one on the basis of fulfilling two, right? So this is the, this is a kind of set of necessary and sufficient conditions that Grice produced. Um, and the way that he tried to argue for this was just by thinking about at least one sense of the ordinary of, of the way that people ordinarily use the word means, right? So he was doing a kind of ordinary language philosophy, trying to unpack things that were implicit already in our concept of meaning. And so here's an example of the kind of one of the su supposedly decisive moves in one of his arguments. He says, I do not think that one should would want to say that you had meant something by throwing the banknote out of the window that he had meant, for example, that A was to or should go away. And so again, the appeal here is to the way that we would ordinarily use the, the word means. Um, and I don't think that's a very good way to find out about 
most things, um, unless what you're trying to do is just study, um, do lexical semantics or something like that. Uh, even then I'm a little skeptical. Um, one problem with this methodology for finding out about how communication and speech text works is that it just hasn't produced consensus, right? So you can just go look at this very long literature of lots and lots of attempts to come up with the right explication for the, the verb meaning or the, the right sort of implicit def def definition. And it just, uh, nobody can agree. And it just doesn't feel like a lot of progress is being made. It, it, it feels like a, a kind of degenerating research program. Okay. But then I think more importantly, um, you know, even if we could get consensus, all that we could really accomplish by by doing this methodology is just recapitulating our kind of folk theory of communication. But that wouldn't satisfy in it, us in any other domains. And we probably shouldn't be seeking that here, right? What we should want is a kind of empirical theory, um, which may wind up disagreeing with our folk theory in some ways. And even if our folk theory turns out to be sort of on the right track, we need some kind of independent justification of it, aside from the fact that it is our folk theory, right? Um, and finally, I think even if we buy into Grice's whole program, although he showed us maybe something about how we communicate, he didn't really tell us why we do it that way. So, so why would revealing our intentions to people be the way in which we communicate and perform speech acts? What's the advantage of doing it in that way? Why not do it some other way? And this is a kind of an urgent issue because there are all these alternative theories out there, alternative theories of communication and speech acts. And so, for example, you have people like Ruth Milliken who argue that we should theorize speech acts and communication in terms of something along the model of biological functions or proper functions. Okay. And we have others like Mitch Green and Dorit Baran who think that the notion of expressing inner states should be really fundamental. And you've got people like Manfred and Brandom and Bart Hertz, who is who Manfred mentioned who think that we should just replace all this talk about mental states to some extent with talk of uh, public commitments where that's a kind of like a normative foundation a sort of non-mentalistic foundation i mean there are lots of variations on exactly how to interpret what that means but it it's it seems like a an alternative that um that's worth considering and then of course there are lots there's a tradition going back to jl austin who was working on his own theory of speech acts at around the same time that grice was coming up with these ideas in in the same you know they were teaching classes together and stuff um that according to which we should be thinking of these things in terms of linguistic convention rather than in terms of in getting your intentions recognized and one thing that all of these theories share it seems is that they they make communicating and performing speech acts less cognitively demanding than Grice seems to suggest. And so a lot of a lot of arguments against Grice take the form of saying, well, surely we're not doing all of that stuff every time we talk to each other or otherwise communicate. It seems like a lot of um, really demanding cognitive work to ascribe to ordinary speakers. And so one motivation for basically all of these alternative kinds of theories and others is that they seem to uh, relieve some of the cognitive burdens that Grice and others have, and, and other Gricians have um, attributed to communicators. Okay, so one second. So, so that really raises the question, well, why should we believe in communicative intentions? Like what, and, and I think the answer to that question has to be a theory of the kind of explanatory work that they do right so in particular like what you know and it has to be an answer to the question why wouldn't we communicate in one of these other ways what do we get out of communicating in this apparently quite cognitively demanding way and and eventually what i'm going to do is i'm going to argue that i although i do think that communicating in the gricean way is pretty cognitively demanding um right it uses up scarce cognitive resources it is it and i think the empirical evidence supports that um, it's worth it, right? We get a lot out of doing it. It's a, it's It allows us to communicate in ways that are much more efficient and powerful than we would otherwise be able to do. And we couldn't do that if we didn't form communicative intentions. If we didn't have, if we didn't perform speech acts involving these complicated states of mind that I described. Okay. So 
here's a preview of the of the argument. So basically, I'm going to take a communicative intention to be to have two important components, and this kind of matches up with the first two clauses of Grice's explication. I'm going to call the first one an effective intention because it's an an intention to produce an effect in an addressee, right? So, for example, a belief. And then the second one I'll call the revelatory intention because it's an intention to re reveal an effective intention to the addressee. And I'm also going to argue later that these these two intentions have to be sort of related in a certain way. They have to one of them has to be a kind of a, a means to the end of of the other. Um, so the argument is going to break the communicative intention into halves and justify each half somewhat separately. So why do we form effective intentions? Well, I'm going to argue that we form effective intentions as part of the process of designing what we say for our addressees. As a result of their role in this process, they set the terms of successful communication. Okay, so we, um, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll fill in the details of that later, but I think that effective intentions play an essential role in the kind of audience design that humans are really good at and that dramatically improves our ability to communicate with others. And then when it comes to revelatory intentions, why do we reveal our effective, effective intentions to others? Why would we do that? Well, the argument I want to give is that this is part of a strategy for achieving our effective intentions in the context of joint planning. So part of what makes the strategy effective is that it leverages our addressees' trust and cooperativity. So basically, at least in many contexts, if you know what my effective intention is, that's going to be a, a, a really helpful thing to me in terms of getting you to think the thing that I want you to think. Okay. Not always, not in every case, but it, but in men, in enough cases that it is, that this is a worthwhile strategy to pursue a lot of the time. Okay. So let's talk about the, what I want to call communication design first. And, and I think the most common term terminology for this in linguistics is audience design. Um, so here's a conversation that I had with my daughter when she was, I think about three, um, she came up and asked me what I was reading, and I was reading some Wittgenstein. Um, so I said, this is one of my philosophy books. It's by a philosopher named Ludwig Wittgenstein. It's called The Philosophical Investigations. And she said, Wittgenstein? And I said, yes. Do you want to know what it says? She said, yes. And I said, well, here's one thing that it says. In order to know what a rule tells us to do, we need help from other people. And she said, other people like our teachers? And I said, yes, or our friends or our family, if they don't help us, we won't know, we won't know what the rule means. And so I want to just highlight some of the ways in which the thing, the answers that I gave to my daughter Una's questions were kind of specific to her. Okay, so imagine contrast that conversation with a, with a similar conversation that I might have had with, say, a colleague who asked the same questions. So when Una asked me, what I was reading, I gave her this long answer, I introduced Wittgenstein, so on. Um, whereas if my colleague had asked me this question, I might have just said the investigations, okay? Why? Well, because Una doesn't know much about philosophy, she hasn't heard of Wittgenstein. Um, so I figured I would start with some very general information about the book to introduce her to a new topic. So my claim is not that all of this like consciously passed through my head before I spoke, but this is the kind of information that seemed that I that I apparently brought to bear on the process of uh, of deciding what to say to her. OK, and we can think of this as message design in the sense that I was deciding which information to, to offer her, um, which beliefs I was going to try and get her to have. Uh, by contrast, right, my colleague has read the book before. All I need to do is increment some information that she already has. On the other hand, even once I had a message in mind, I still had to think about like how to frame it. And that differs depending on my addressee as well. So, you know, when explaining uh, the the sort of rule following problem to Una, right, I had to come up with some really basic way to frame it. Whereas when I spoke to my colleague, I could say things like, I think, I think I think the view is that following a rule is an essentially social practice. Okay, so Una doesn't know what a social practice is or what the word essentially means. So I have to I had to use some simpler ways of saying the same thing or something similar at least. By contrast, my colleague knows lots of philosophical terminology and would be offended if I talked to her like a kid, right? So I so I could so I would say things like essentially social practice. Okay. So just switching topics for a second. I like I want to explain how all of this reasoning that goes into communication design works. Um, 
I want to switch over and talk about what intentions are in general and the role that they play in practical reasoning and, and what I want to call hierarchical planning, borrowing some terminology from Michael Bratman. Okay. So, so I'm going to talk about how these three parts of the mind uh, or these three capacities of the mind relate to each other. So let's zoom in on planning. Suppose I've got an intention to go to Austin, Texas, right? To give a talk. Um, well, that alone, that plan alone is not going to get me to Austin, right? It's a partial plan in the sense that all the details might be, might remain to be worked out. So I've got to start reasoning about how to get there, um, you know, about the means and implementation of this, of this plan. Okay. And in order to do that, I'm going to bring to bear whatever relevant beliefs, other intentions, and the, the pressure to sort of form plans in rationally coherent ways. So I might, as a result of that, form a sub plan of my prior intention to book a flight, okay, because it's too long of a drive from New York. But of course, once I've got an intention to book a flight, I'm not done. I've got to keep, I've got to start thinking about which flight to book and how to book it and all that kind of stuff. Okay, so I might form an intention to book a specific JetBlue flight. But still, I've got to keep reasoning in order to actually get myself to Austin. Or and and so even that sub plan then needs to be needs to be the sort of premise and further practical reasoning. And eventually that's got to lead to motor instructions to move my fingers in a specific way uh, in order to actually book the flight, right? And in general, um, planning seems to work this way. Um, and I think that's for a good reason, right? We, we, it, it allows us to break complex multivariate decisions into tractable chunks, right? So like we are not uh, omniscient, infinitely intelligent beings. And so we need to sort of break a big complicated problem into pieces so that we can make decisions about each piece. But then part of the reason that we do this in this hierarchical way is that our initial decisions constrain the later ones and make them easier, right? So um, if I start trying to book flights before I know where I'm flying, then uh, I've got a much more complicated, um, much more complicated decision to make. I've got way too many options to consider. But if I already know where I'm going, that really allows me to make a more, more constrained decision. Um, likewise, it allows us to sort of, as a result of these things, build complex plans that are way more complex than we could otherwise manage, right? Again, this is a, a strategy that creatures with finite minds can use to have to wind up with really complicated um, plans and complex actions. In order to, one second. In order to accomplish this, um, we need to sort of be uh, sensitive to what Michael Bratman and others call rational requirements. So for example, it's important that we intend what we take the, to be the necessary means to our intended ends. Uh, it's important that we try to form consistent intentions, at least by our own lights. It's important that we don't form intentions to do things that we don't think we can do. Um, and these are kind of global requirements on how our beliefs and intentions can fit together if we're going to be rational agents. And of course, if we violate these, uh, these rational requirements, then it's very likely that we'll wind up uh, frustrated in our attempts to act. Um, and it sort of follows from that way of thinking about planning that the, the sort of practical reasoning process has to be domain general and unencapsulated in the sense that it is sensitive to all manner of beliefs about that, that could turn out to be relevant, um, our preferences about what we want to accomplish and the other intentions that we have that are that our new intentions have to be consistent with right so in general practical reasoning is this kind of unencapsulated and domain general um, cognitive process um, one of the benefits of it is that it'll it gives us a way of achieving really abstract goals by which I mean goals that you would have to act on in really different ways, depending on your information about the world, depending on the context. Okay. So for example, if I want to host a dinner party, well, the specific bodily movements involved in doing that would be really different depending on things like who I want to invite and what I'm going to serve and when it's going to happen and all of those things. So that that's a really abstract goal in the sense that how it translates to bodily movements is a, an extremely uh, indirect and um, context sensitive uh, matter. Okay. 
Um, likewise, you could say the same thing about social goals, by which I mean goals where exactly what you should do, what it would be rational to do, depends on what other people do or what they, how they will react to what you do. Okay. So I want to argue now that um, this kind of practical reasoning that I just described, this kind of hierarchical planning, is the kind of practical reasoning that we use to do uh, communication design. Okay. So let's think about what kind of psychological process must have gone into the way that I designed my speech for my daughter, for example. Well, it had to be domain general and unencapsulated. It had to be sensitive to all of my other beliefs and plans and preferences. Um, after all, it, it recruits and integrates information about my subject matter, which could be like anything that I want to talk about but also about my daughter and her beliefs and goals and her linguistic abilities, right? So all of that stuff, all of that information needs to be integrated in order for this to work properly. Okay. Um, it's also hierarchical, right? So my, uh, my prior intentions about how to interact with my daughter and the kinds of things that I want to do with her inform my intentions about what to say. And then those intentions inform, uh, sh shape my, plans about how to say it okay um my the kinds of um it, it sort of allows me to pr pursue pretty abstract and social goals right so for example how i answered una's wh question about what i was reading very that how to answer that question can vary a lot depending on what i believe about the subject matter and my addressee okay um and so the specific bodily movements that i need to do in order to answer a question can be enormously different depending on who I'm talking to and what I believe about them and what I believe about this, the thing that they asked me about and so on. And it leads to complex and coordinated action, right? So just consider one utterance, right? I need to organize a whole bunch of words into a specific order. I need to sort of uh, plan out the prosody of the, of the utterance. I need to sort of like achieve the right balance of presupposed and, and asserted information. And all of this needs to be somehow conditioned on my beliefs about my daughter, right? And that's just one utterance. When you start talking about longer chains of discourse, of course, I think there's great reasons to think that more complicated planning still needs to be managed, uh, possibly joint planning, as I'll talk about later. Okay. Okay, so so that was a kind of an argument that the the communication design process has all the hallmarks of just ordinary practical reasoning, the kind of hierarchical practical reasoning that you would use to plan a dinner party, for example. Although obviously it must happen much more quickly in, in at least some cases. Um, so let's think about the role of communicative intentions in this process, right? So first, I think it's worth seeing that a communicative intention itself, so here I've got Grice's three clauses that he gave us of a communicative intention. It's worth seeing that a communicative intention itself is itself has the the kind of hierarchical plan that I've been talking about and bears the hallmarks it, it sort of bears the um, the features of the, that you would expect a, of an output of this planning process. Okay, so in general, the effective intention and the and the revelatory intention stand in this plan sub plan relationship. Okay. I try to reveal my intention to you as a strategy for getting you into the state of mind that I'm trying to get you into. And so Grice's third clause in his definition, I think, is just really trying to say that, okay? And I don't think we need to posit a further intention in order to make sense of that idea. Rather, we should just say that the first two intentions in his definition, the intention to produce a response and the or, or an, an effect, and the intention to reveal that intention, that those stand in a in a plan sub plan relationship. Okay. Um, but of course, it's not as though we form these intentions out of nowhere for no reason, rather, they themselves are usually sub plans of our other intentions, right? So I, I, why do I try and get you to believe something? Well, it's because that's a good way of accomplishing my other my sort of broader, more, more abstract goals. Okay. And that's what I want to say is the message design process, right? That the process of deciding what to say and to whom in a way that furthers my other uh, my other plans, my other intentions, okay? Um, and of course, once I have an intention to reveal an intention to somebody, once I have a revelatory intention, my job is not done there. I need to turn that into specific motor 
control instructions, right? I need to turn that into movements of my mouth or hands or probably both. Um, and that's what I want to call the signal design process, the process of deciding what to actually utter as a way of communicating a specific message that I've got to somebody, okay? Um, and collectively, that's the communication design process. And I think there are just really good reasons to think that we should expect communicative intentions to arise in the context of a process that works in this way. Um, so let's, here's a kind of argument, okay? So to, so premise one is what I've already been arguing for, to, to explain communication design, we need to posit domain general practical reasoning that bridges abstract goals and motor instructions. Like that's just an application of a general principle about how we do practical reasoning in general. The intermediate outputs of practical reasoning are intentions. Those are just kind of the steps along the way. That's, that follows from this general theory of what practical reasoning is. There will be one such intention that first pairs a message to be communicated with an addressee, okay? And this has to be the case because message design has to culminate with such an intention, right? So that uh, it just is a message design is a decision about what to say and to whom. And the signal design process has to sort of begin from such an intention. It needs that as an input, uh, as a starting place, because after all, signal design is reasoning about how to communicate this message to this addressee, okay? But that that first intention that, um, in th that pairs a message to be communicated with an addressee, that's just the first component of a communicative intention. It's an effective intention, okay? And there's a really good reason to think that that's the thing that would set this that set the terms of successful communication because and and that's what makes it kind of special that's why it plays such a special role in the theory of communication because that's the that's the 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 point in the process at which you decide what you're trying to communicate and to whom and that sort of sets this sets the terms of success okay so i think there are big advantages of having uh having a kind of um communication design process that works this way, it allows us to communicate in the service of abstract goals, right? So I can invite you to my dinner party, but only because that invitation is embedded in this more complicated plan to have a dinner party. Um, it allows us to convey more things to more people, right? So if I didn't have this ability to reason, to, to sort of bring my practical reasoning to bear on the, on the communica communication process, I don't think I would be able to tell my daughter about Wittgenstein. Um, it makes things very efficient. Um, I can, for example, avoid boring my colleague with all kinds of redundant information about Wittgenstein. So we can fit more information into smaller packages because we know something about the mind of the person that we are communicating with and we can avoid telling them more than they need. Um, it allows us to be cooperative, right? So because I can condition what I say on my addressee's goals, but it also by the same token allows me to be strategic because I can, uh, I can say things in ways that will further my own goals, given what I know about uh, my addressee's possibly conflicting goals. Okay, so these are, I think, really significant advantages of a system that allows us to organize what we say and and how we say it around in, in a way that's responsive to what we know about our addressees. Um, but I also think that this unlocks, I think, features of natural language that we just wouldn't have if we weren't um, if we weren't communication designers of this kind if we couldn't do this okay so i'll talk more about this in a moment but we have these really rich noun phrase systems that sort of let us leverage our addressees perspectives on a referent to tell them more about it so i'll talk more about that in a second we have ambiguous and context sensitive expressions that let us communicate many messages with smaller lexicons right so uh but that only really works i think if you can anticipate when your addressee is going to be sort of understanding these expressions in ways that are different than your, the way that you're using them. Okay. We're also lexical specialists, right? So this is really approximate, but you know, English has over a million words. If you sort of re look through the Oxford English dictionary, but each of us probably only has about a hundred thousand of them. Uh, if we're a native English speaker, um, and that is really useful because it allows us to each specialize and have the vocabulary and the lexicon that's most useful to us, given our interests and the things that we have to communicate about. 
Um, but of course, it wouldn't work very well if we couldn't anticipate when uh, the person that we're talking to uh, uh, doesn't doesn't have one of the words that we uh, might intend to use. And so it's really important that we're able to track differences in in uh, states of mind across ad addressees in order to, for us to be able to use languages that are designed in this way. Okay. And then in general, it seems that our ability to interpret it indirect and polysemous speech acts and to manage lexical variation is is just a is our, is just a precondition of our large lexicons in the first place, right? So the fact that we have a hundred thousand vocabulary items in our native language, in in at least many cases, um, it, if you look at the processes by which people acquire vocabulary, by which a new vocabulary gets introduced into the language, I think it's quite plausible that we just wouldn't have such big lexicons if we weren't able to um if we weren't able to do this kind of design process so i won't i won't try and argue for that in detail now but i think that's a plausible claim that i can talk about in the q a okay so i talked i've already talked about effective intentions the intention to produce why why we form these intentions to produce um states of mind in our addressees why why do we why would we reveal those intentions to others why would we try and have revelatory intentions as well so why, in other words, is revealing my intention to produce a certain state of mind in you an effective strategy for getting that state of mind into your head? Well, here's a, here's a first observation. We don't have to reveal our intentions to others in order to change their minds in the way that we intend, right? So sometimes we use reverse psychology, or we might just present somebody with direct evidence where they don't need to sort of reason about our intentions in order to come to the right conclusion. Um, but here's a second observation. In general, revealing your intention to change someone's mind often makes it much easier to change it. Okay. So think about how much more difficult it would be to communicate lots of things if you were trying to do so in a way where your addressee was not supposed to find out that that's what you intended them to think, right? Like that would be a really difficult thing. Imagine trying to teach a class or just, you know, uh, tell your, um, partner when you were going to be home from work or anything while concealing your intention about what uh about what you wanted them to think okay really difficult not impossible like i say we do it with reverse psychology sometimes we can manipulate people in all kinds of ways but it usually requires a lot more um a lot more effort and it's uh, it's it's difficult to pull off it re and it often requires very special circumstances to do so an interesting question is, well, why would that be? Why is, why is that, why is it usually harder to communicate something without revealing that that's what you're trying to do? Um, and I think the answer to this lies in some facts about the nature of cooperative joint activities in general, right? So think about things like <coughs> trying to move a heavy sofa across the room in a way that requires somebody else's help or, you know, dancing with someone, right? So these are textbook examples of joint activity. And I think thinking about the nature of joint activity, I think can help us to see something that's special about communication and why we would reveal our intentions to people. So, so in general, again, this is very influenced by the work of Michael Bratman. Um, in general, um, to successfully do joint actions, the participants need to have sort of meshing subplans of a, of a shared intention. That's that's Bratman's claim. Okay, so in ge in general, like it's going to be a lot easier, for example, to move the sofa across the room if we both have an intention to do that, and we sort of under and we have um, compatible um, subplans of that intention. Like I intend to pick up one end of the sofa, and you intend to pick up the other end of the sofa, and we intend to move the sofa in ways that are sort of that fit together, right? And of course, that works a lot better if we, if each of us knows um, about the plans, that, the sort of contributions to that plan that the other one has. Okay, so, so you know, if I'm trying to get you to move the sofa across the room with me, of course, I might be able to somehow do that without revealing to you where I'm trying to get the sofa, but it's going to be a lot more difficult. Okay, because I, if because if you don't know where I'm trying to get it, then you just kind of don't know which. Um, which actions would be eff efficient contributions to that uh, to that joint project? Okay, so I kind of think that the same thing is going on in communication. So, um, um, uh, if if we want to coordinate our effort in a conversation, then knowing what we're trying to do 
and having you in particular know what I'm trying to to do in the context of that joint project, I think makes the whole thing go a lot more smoothly. So for example, right now, hopefully you're investing a lot of cognitive resources in our shared project of communicating, including understanding what I'm saying and assessing what I'm saying and deciding whether to, to believe it, right? Um, it's It's hard work actually listening to a talk and understanding everything. And if I've got an audience who is not investing that effort, then it's going to be way harder for me to get my points across. Okay. And I think that kind of cognitive effort is the equivalent of the effort that my companion has to put into the project of moving the sofa across the room. Okay. So to do this effectively, you just need to know things about what, for, for example, that I intend you to think something. Um, and, and then in order to in invest the effort into assessing what I'm saying, you need to know what I intend you to think. Okay. And I think that we see evidence of this kind of joint planning in a whole bunch of different work in pragmatics. Um, so in general, I think knowing that a speaker's effective intention is a sub plan of some shared conversational plan that we've got is a really important part of the process by which we recognize what people mean uh, in a lot of contexts, right? So this was part of what Grice thought is going on with implicature and indirect communication in general, right? If 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 I'm trying to figure out what you're implicating and I can't go directly on uh, the words that you used, because after all, there's no, in a conversational implicature, there's not no direct connection between those two things. Well, what what kind of information do I have to go on? Well, if I know what the, what kind of conversation we're having, what the goal is, what plans we've already formed together, that gives me a lot of information about uh, about what you might mean, okay? What in, and and especially if I assume that your intention, your communicative intention, is a sub plan of our of our shared of our shared uh, plan, okay? Likewise, I think there's a lot of recent work connecting up. Um, uh, shared planning to things like how we sort of track the cutoffs for gradable, gradable adjectives over the course of a conversation, how we um, how we sort of manage which discourse reference are, uh, are sort of active and can be relied upon over the course of a conversation in order to resolve an AFRA. And then, of course, I think there's just incredible amounts of work on the role of the question under discussion in, in pragmatics. And I think the best way to think about what a question under discussion is what it is for some question to be the question under discussion in a conversation is just for the participants in the conversation to have a shared plan about what they're trying to accomplish at that moment in the conversation. So I think if you think about the role of shared plans in conversations, it's there's just all these ways in which they can facilitate um, efficient information exchange. And I don't think they are essential for human communication, but they certainly make things a lot more efficient and make things easier. Okay, that's that's the that's the claim. Okay. And so, why do we have revelatory intentions in light of all of what I said? Well, look, my, revealing my intention to change your mind is an effective strategy for changing it only if you trust me. Okay, so you're if I'm trying to get you to believe something, knowing what I'm trying to get you to believe might be a good way to do that, but only if you are sort of cooperative and trusting. This is a limitation, right? It means that we shouldn't expect intention recognition to work in situations that aren't cooperative in the right ways, okay? I think that's a good empirical prediction, by the way. Um, but it's also a strength, right? It means that by revealing my intention to you, I'm sort of recruiting you into a shared project of understanding me and sharing information. And if all goes well, that means that you will be motivated to invest your own cognitive resources into this project. And this is a huge advantage for me compared to other strategies of, for example, getting people to believe things. Okay, so that's that's why I think we reveal our intentions. Um, it's part of the overall sort of way in which joint planning facilitates conversation. Okay, okay. So um, I'm I, I I need to I'm I'm basically out of time. So I'm gonna just maybe I should just skip this part. Um, yeah, I think I'm just going to skip this part, but the, the upshot of it basically is that I don't think this is just for special occasions. I don't think it's, um, I don't think it's, uh, I, I don't think all of this reasoning and communication design and joint planning is something that we do just once in a while. I think it's presupposed by the way that ordinary language works, by the way that natural languages are sort of designed and the, 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 the basic, um, argument that I 
would give in more detail if I had time for, for that is just that if you look at, for example, how noun phrase systems work and think about things like the familiarity hierarchy and the fact that we often have like lots and lots of ways to refer to a given referent, um, lots of different noun phrases that we could use. And we, the way that we actually make those decisions is by thinking about what our, our addressee's perspective on that referent is. Um, uh, I, I think that you can make a pretty clear argument that uh, in order to be a sort of pragmatically competent user of a natural language of the kind that we have, you just need to be uh, uh, doing all this communication design and thinking about joint plans in this way. Again, that's not to say that we do this 100% of the time when we're communicating. Rather, it's to say that in order to be a fully competent user of language who is taking full advantage of the resources that natural languages give us, um, you've got to be doing this often enough. Okay. Um, so I'm going to skip through this part. Um, but that was the general point of it. Um, and I think that the same point goes for lots of other expressions aside from noun phrases, basically. And again, I won't talk about this in detail, but I think there's quite a bit of psycholinguistic evidence that supports this way of thinking about it, right? So if you look at work on things like the director task and recent work um, on the rational speech act model, I think the the thing that you come out come away from that thinking is that like pragmatic reasoning about others' perspectives is cognitively demanding, but we normally do a lot of it seemingly as a matter of course, not not only on special occasions when we've got some really difficult task. And plausibly, that the reason for this is that it makes us way better at communicating. It allows us to communicate in much more efficient and um, and uh, powerful ways. Okay, so here's the conclusions then. I think human humans engage in lots of communication design and joint conversational planning. This makes us much better communicators than we would otherwise be. It also enables some valuable features of natural language that I don't think you should expect to see in natural language if uh, we weren't doing this at least a lot of the time, okay? And we do this by applying a general purpose practical reasoning and mind reading capacities, right? So the 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 cognitive capacities that are needed in order to engage in this kind of um, communication design and joint planning are basically our general purpose um, practical reasoning and mind reading capacities. And if you think that, then it gives you a very powerful reason to posit communicative intentions, to think that communicative intentions are features of lots and lots of ordinary communicative interactions, including linguistic communication, but not just not just linguistic communication. So thanks very much. We continue with a comment by Josh Armstrong, and then we can pitch in. Please, Josh, the floor is yours. Uh, hopefully you can see uh, yes. my screen. Um, so thanks so much uh, for the invite to come and comment on Dan's paper, and, and thanks again for the interesting talk. It's great to continue the long conversation we've been having for many years. Um, so I want to um, speak for maybe about 10 minutes. Um, and say over the course of that 10 minutes, try to make three points. The first is to say something about why I think Dan's project is important. And so just saying a little bit of background about what I think is innovative about what Dan is up to and interested in. Uh, and then I wanna turn uh, in the second part to raising some challenges for Dan's project, um, some big, some small, um, and I don't think um, these um, undermine all of what Dan is after, but they do, I think, lead to some complications and raise uh, the need for certain kinds of clarifications about exactly how prominent the kinds of mechanisms that Dan is describing are playing in our normal face-to-face -face communicative interactions. And then I want to close very briefly at the end by just talking about the ways in which I think progress on these issues uh, among linguists and philosophers of language require going beyond normal sources of evidence that we're too accustomed to using. And so I don't think that we can rely on intuitions about language specific sentences. I don't think that we can rely even on some of the usual experimental paradigms like things like the director's task, which tend to highlight um, possibly strange contexts of interaction in various ways. And so I'll suggest um, some, some need for additional sources of traction. So, okay. So first, uh, why is Dan's project important? And so I think that if I was to give a summary of what I think makes Grice's 
project interesting, it was the introduction into the study of language in a prominent way, what might be just called the pragmatic strategy of explanation. And this pragmatic strategy of explanation looks to see how we can get interesting generalizations about how language works, the form and structure of language, or more generally, the, the practices that we have of engaging in communication, trying to drive generalizations in those domains from just starting with the idea that um, the users of the systems are rational and they do what is rational in context of cooperative social interaction. And so you just begin with that observation and you try to run to see how many um, facts about our practices or the structure of language can be derived. And I think by any reasonable standard, this has been an extremely fruitful project uh, or strategy of explanation. I think um, to just give one instance, if you look at Robert Stallnacker's work um, uh, on presupposition, on conditionals, on assertion, you see the way in which engaging in this um, pragmatic strategy of explanation turns out to be very fruitful for elucidating core parts of, of our practices of language use. There is a challenge though, and the challenge is one that Jan mentioned, namely many people who have invested, especially philosophers are particularly guilty of this, um, invested in trying to utilize this pragmatic strategy have either relied on conceptual analysis, which Dan talks about, but an, a second strategy that they've used is a so-called strategy of rational reconstruction, which is not to try to explicate the meaning of our words and concepts, but to give an idealized set of str strictures or an idealized model, which specifies explicit principles, which were they to be known or present in the minds of agents would suffice to explain some target phenomena. Um, and I think that um, uh, both the project of conceptual analysis and the project of conceptual uh, rational reconstruction leave many people cold. And I think for good reason, because for one thing, it's unclear how much actual insight you get into why people do the things they do when they do them. And so providing anything like explanatory causal um, interventions and thinking about what's going on in the circumstances is left very obscure. And more generally, it's often hard, um, very difficult to see how you'd ever falsify a rational reconstruction or a conceptual analysis. Um, and so I think for, for good reason, um, Dan is interested in moving us toward a more explanatory model of our of, of social phenomena. Now, Dan is, of course, not the only one to do this. Uh, many relevance theorists, um, Sperber and Wilson and Robert Karsten, have suggested similar things um, in some people working in so-called super linguistics of so people like Philippe Schlinker are also interested in these kinds of projects. But crucially, most of these um, uh, more recent attempts to engage in this kind of pragmatic explanation depart in large or small part from Grice's original project. And so either you don't get all three of, of Grice's um, initial principles playing interesting effects Maybe the, the, they, um, there's no serious attempt to engage with, with mind reading um, as in arguably some of Philippe's um, work. And so I think this is what makes uh, Dan's project particularly interesting is effectively he's an um, OG Gricean. He's interested in understanding the original strictures that Grice was proposing, the structure of the communicative attention as Grice was the kind of first person to really put his finger on and then giving a, a kind of causal um, explanation in social domains using those strictures. And so I think this is a, a really useful and interesting kind of program that, that does in different important ways from other existing attempts to engage in that kind of causal social explanation. Okay, so now let me turn to some challenges for, for Dan's project. Uh, one um, challenge is a very general one. In work in neurocognitive um, kind of mechanistic description, there's a lot of attention being paid to how do you individuate a causal mechanism? What makes one causal mechanism different from another? It turns out this is a really difficult problem. And so in work in memory systems, so do we have, do, do humans have three uh, neural mechanisms for memory? Do they have one? Um, what, how do you give the confines of where one mechanism in the, in the causal, uh, cognitive domain ends and the other begins? It turns out this is a very difficult problem. Um, uh, and so I think some of the details of, of distinguishing where the planning mechanisms end and mind reading begins, um, where, where spatial navigation ends and uh, social navigation starts, these are, these are difficult problems, but I don't think that's specific to, to Dan. I think a more general kind of challenge 
um, turns to issues about whether communication might be prior to and more basic than the use of comedic intentions, which is something I think Dan is more or less agreeing with, but I guess I would and, and have defended in some of my other work, an idea that um, it's never the case that um, the ability for an agent to engage in mind reading sets the terms for what communicative success consists in. That communicative success always consists in the ability of agents to coordinate their mental states. That is to, 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 to have a, a perspective on a situation that doesn't have to be identical, but where they each have a perspective on the situation that's mediated by the, the one another's actions for which they have no reason to unilaterally deviate, effectively an equilibrium state in their mental states vis-a-vis -vis their actions and responses. Um, and that's always what successful communication requires in certain cases and, and for reasons that Dan suggests, I'm not opposed to the idea that the means by which we establish success goes by way of these rich intentions, but success is always kind of finding us in situations for which we have no reason to unilaterally deviate from our strategy of, of coordination of our, of our mental states. And so for that reason, and I think that you can see other animals and small children and non-neurotypical agents being able to communicate successfully, even though they don't have the means of using these rich kinds of intentions. Um, so that's one kind of challenge. Now I wanna to turn to challenge 2.C here on the outline. I think that um, this raises a specific question. Even if we grant that humans do have the specific mechanisms that Dan is describing, does that vindicate a kind of causal version of Grice's original analysis? And I think it's an open question whether that's so, because I think it can, we can have capacities but not employ them in a given context. And so we might have capacities that we deploy in context specific or um, uh, strategic kinds of ways. And more specifically, there might be the way that we can engage in a, a, a sequence discourse or a dialogue that unfolds over time without using complex plans. Because maybe the way that we're engaging in the dialogue is by relying on something like a social script, which is effectively a generalized uh, sequence of actions, which, which we think will normally um, be carried out on the basis of things like social features of the agents. Um, and you know, so we might go and order a coffee um, via utilizing something like a script without in the actual instance tokening a complex hierarchical plan in the Bratman style form. Likewise, you know, uh, a lot of work on social cognition has emphasized the way in which we can engage in social cognition without engaging in mentalizing or mind reading because we might represent an agent as an uh, individual and represent features of their uh, goal-directed agency um, without thereby coming to represent their states of belief or their capacity for a level two perspective. Um, and I think some parts of audience design can be understood in these kinds of ways. And so um, you might represent me as an individual agent. You might recall that last week, um, uh, so you, you might represent me as an agent and only speak because you represent the presence of another agent in the context. Um, but more kind of relevant for audience design, you might recall that last week we were talking about my sister's soccer game. Um, and that uh, recall of the co-presence of me and you in the conversational context of a discussion of my sister's soccer game may guide you in asking some questions that you would not otherwise have asked were we had not to have those prior experiences. Um, and so our co-presence of a prior event might queue up um, memory dependent uh, processes that give us a kind of audience design without um, either of us thereby tokening uh, our complex representations of things like beliefs. And so I think that it's an open question that just has to be kind of carried out in an empirical way, how much of both dialogue and audience design require the specific mechanisms that Dan is invoking. And um, I, I, I wanna uh, quickly close, but let me just give a general form of this argument, which I think um, Dan was sort of uh, cautioning that or, or, or gesturing toward at the end, but um, uh, I just want to make the general form of the argument. So the, the, the argument form here is something like this. Um, um, the specific capacities for hierarchical plans and for mind reading are cognitively effortful or computationally costly. It seems like there's a reasonable premise that an agent will only 
uh, token or actively deploy a computational, computationally costly mechanism if the, the social or cognitive benefits exceed the cost of invoking them. Uh, the third premise would be something like, uh, for many contexts of communication or social interaction, we can get the benefits of those social interactions without paying the cost of the computationally costly mechanisms. And then, so in conclusion, uh, so there are many contexts of, of human language use or social interaction where we don't actually token those rich mechanisms. Now, in response to this kind of worry, um, one thing would, would be to just go in and, and deny the premise that uh, we don't actually pay the cost in all these contexts. And so argue that no, to actually get, get the benefits, we do have to pay the cost in every context. A second weaker response um, would, would grant that there are many contexts of communication or of human language use where we're not actually using these mechanisms, but to suggest that we use them often enough um, for them to get a grip in thinking about uh, changes in the whole architecture of language or the architecture of distinctly human social um, interaction. And, um, but I, I do think that uh, the weaker and stronger responses are very different in thinking about how essential or how constitutive of our human practices these uh, cognitive resources in fact are. Okay, so lastly, um, how do we settle these kinds of debates? And so um, Dan tells you we, we need these resources. I say we need them sometimes, but often we, we don't actually um, invoke them. How do you settle these kinds of debates? And I think um, you should, uh, we, we can't use standard tools that we're used to using, I think, in linguistics and philosophy of language that rely just on thinking about acceptability judgments or entailment judgments in patterns of language use. Um, and so I think one way to get traction here is by looking at sources of data that come from a comparative domains. And so looking at what kinds of audience design other primates can do, who pr presumably don't have these capacities for complex plans, but um, that, that's probably a little bit harder to assess, but, but arguably don't have the specific uh, mentalizing capacities that we have. What kinds of audience design can they do? Likewise, um, consider a, like a, a, a two-year-old child that, um, uh, does not fluently pass false belief tasks, but does have some capacities for social cognition, what kind of audience design can they do? Um, uh, these are kinds of sources of data that are, are not usually invoked um, in philosophy of language and linguistics, but I think is really important for adjudicating between um, ongoing debates. And then likewise, the last thing that I'll say is I think that thinking about stakes variation in humans is important. And what I mean by stakes variations is variations in the degree to which the agents, it matters to the agents of whether or not their interaction is successful in the communicative um, domain. And so I think that it's the kind of thing where in some context of for me and the barista and ordering a latte, it's okay if communication fails. It's very easy to, to, to fix it and recover how you might correct it. Um, um, you know, in other kinds of conversations, um, say in a conversation with your dean about whether you get leave next year, um, it really matters a lot to you that things go successfully and it has can have a lot of collateral social damage to you if things go poorly. In these kinds of cases, the stakes are really high. And so it might be that you're using different kinds of cognitive resources than you do in other low stakes kind of contexts. And so I think thinking about variation in how much it matters to the agents or whether communication fails could also be a useful probe for kind of gaining traction on when, why, and how we use a variety of cognitive resources for coping um, with the demands of successful communication. Okay, at that, I'll stop. And so thanks again to everyone. Thank you. So Dan, uh, if you have the need to respond to some of these points, um, so. Let me just respond to a couple of things, because I think that I, the, the reason that I find Josh so uh, helpful to talk to is that we have so much agreement about like the big picture sort of methodological stuff and, and a lot of interest in all of these kind of other sources of evidence that, on these topics. But, I, but then, of course, I think he's really good at pushing me to clarify exactly what I'm committed to and what I'm not. And so just just on that topic, I think it it really probably would help everyone else to understand what it what my position is to just respond to a couple of things that Josh mentioned. So one is just this this point about, look, I just agree with Josh that there are all kinds of communication that are not Gricean intention recognition, right? And that uh, 
non-human animals are doing all kinds of communication that we should not think of in, in Gricean terms, probably. And that when human children are communicating, at least a lot of the time, although they might be doing a kind of degraded form of Gricean communication, there are really good reasons to think that they are not successfully pulling off all of the stuff that I'm talking about, right? So like, they're pretty bad at mind reading. Um, they are not the most effective planners, right? Um, but I, but I think actually that's a good, it's a, it's for that reason, I think the theory that I was giving gives kind of the right empirical predictions in the sense that there are going to be a lot of features of natural language that we should expect little kids to be bad at using as a result of that, right? So for example, my daughter, when she was three, was terrible at selecting noun phrases, right? She would use definites when she should have been using indefinites and she, she would sort of not introduce her subject matter before just plowing through. And we would have conversations with her for a few days about some character. And then we would only later realize that it was somebody that she saw on TV at daycare. And, um, and so I think the, the, the right sort of prediction is um, on my view is not that humans always communicate in this way or that they always successfully deploy every component of the sort of suite of cognitive capacities that I'm talking about, but rather that adult humans do it often enough that we see the results in the way that natural language is set up to presuppose that we have that we have these sort of underlying cognitive capacities that we sort of deploy um, in 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 uh, in using language, right? So the example that I talked about pretty briefly towards the end of the talk is just the fact that we have this rich noun phrase system that gives us for all intents and purposes, an, an infinite number of different noun phrases that we could use even after we've already settled on a referent. And the way that you pick between them is by thinking about your addressee's perspective on that referent. That suggests that in order to be a fully competent user of natural language, you've got to be doing this kind of audience design. But of course, that doesn't mean that not yet fully competent language users or highly distracted language users or language users who are merely ordering coffee or whatever have to be doing that all of that all the time. Um, rather, we just have to be doing it often enough because of its advantages that you would expect natural language to wind up being set up in that way um, to, so as to make those advantages available to us. And then I think jo Josh is really right to press press me on the question, well, what is often enough? Like how how often do we have to be doing this kind of full-blown Gricean communication in order for that, for the sort of benefits of that to, to result in design features of natural language being as they are? And I just think that's a really interesting empirical question. I don't know the answer, right? Like it could, it could very well be that this is one of these things where the, you know, so like Ruth Milliken gives this example of saying that like, you know, the the proper function of a sperm is to fertilize an egg, even though, you know, maybe only one in every hundred billion sperm actually succeed in doing that, right? And so there's a really interesting question. Well, how often would you, ex do you have to expect us to be doing full-blown Gricean communication in order for natural language to come to sort of be designed in a way that presupposes that we do that? Maybe it's only a quarter of the time, right? Even for undistracted adults. Um, and I just think that's a, I just don't even know how one would go about answering that question at the moment. Um, and so, yeah, so I think, but I think the, the point of all this is that it's really important to see that I am not making the claim that often gets attributed to Grice and lots of other Gricians, that this is like an essential feature of every single human communicative interaction, but rather that it is in some sense, a normal and functional feature to enough of an extent that our tools for communicating have come to be organized in ways that presuppose that we do it. Um, so that's, that's kind of how the argument goes. Okay. And I just agree with most of the other stuff that Josh said. Um, I think it's true that there are ways that other animals, for example, manage extended communicative interactions in a way that's like dialogue-like. Josh's work is a really great thing to look at if you want to know more about that, right? So he has this amazing paper called Provincialism and Pragmatics that argues that there's something like common ground in great ape communication. I just think that 
the very specific details of the ways in which adult humans organize conversations and the very specific details of the way in which natural language allows us to do that um, should lead us to think that at least a lot of the time in humans, we need to be integrating information about our subject matter and our addressees' mental states on the fly in a way that presupposes that we can't make use of these less cognitively demanding mechanisms in order to do that. Um, so I think it's it's only by looking at the gory details of things like the way the noun phrase system is designed that you can get come to grips with exactly why we should posit the Gricean thing in the human case. It's not because I'm saying it's an essential precondition of any kind of audience design or anything like that. Um, yeah, so that's the that's the kind of claim. But yeah, so basically, I think Josh and I agree about a lot. And then there's all these really interesting empirical questions that we are both really curious about. Um, 